Good morning, everyone. I am Jim Vigman, and I have the uh, privilege of uh, chairing this uh, webinar, which is about the sixth in our series of webinars on emerging trends in automobile insurance for healthcare professionals. Uh, this webinar is uh, slightly different than the format in our prior uh, webinars in that we have uh, included uh, a prestigious uh, medical representative and industry, uh, rather insurance industry representative, uh, as part of the mix. Uh, seated uh, to my left uh, is uh, Dr. Xiao. Dr. Xiao is a dual certified radiologist and nuclear medicine physician. For the past uh, 14 years, Dr. Xiao has been director of nuclear medicine at South Lake Regional Health Center in Newmarket. Uh, seated immediately to uh, Dr. Xiao's left is Barb Sulzenko Lori. Uh, she serves as Vice President, Policy and Senior Advisor uh, to the IBC, which is the Insurance Bureau of Canada. Uh, in this role, Barb applies her extensive public policy knowledge to ensure IBC's insurance operations are thorough, creative and workable. And at the end of the front row, uh, to the left of Barb, uh, is Alana Strelick. She's an Accident Benefit Coordinator at McLeish Orlando. And seated uh, in the second row on the far left, uh, Dale Orlando, uh, who is uh, known to, I'm sure, all of you in the uh, audience, a founding partner of McLeish Orlando and past president on the Ontario Trial Lawyers Association. Uh, to his right or left uh, is Alana Strelick, or sorry, Marva Harriet Stewart, who is an accident benefit specialist at Oatley Vigman. And on the right is John McLeish. Um, who again is known to you and is uh, one of um, Oatla's founding partners and uh, co-author of the Oatley McLeish Guides to Personal Injury Practice in Motor Vehicle Litigation and the Guides to Brain Injury Litigation. And finally to John's right, uh, my partner Raj Rowley who has run up to the stage at the last minute having endured a few auto accidents on his way here but has made it. Um, and uh, Roger, as you will know, is a pioneer in personal injury litigation uh, as well. So we have uh, a great panel, uh, and we're looking forward to uh, having some discourse with you and with our panel members. We ask that uh, you take advantage of this opportunity that Dr. Xiao presents and that Barb presents in terms of uh, getting the industry perspective and uh, learning about uh, MRI and brain spec. Uh, brain imaging. We're going to start off with uh, uh, John McLeish. Uh, however, you'll note that on the lower left-hand side of the screen, uh, you'll see a question box. Please uh, take advantage of that. Uh, we're interested in receiving your questions uh, for any of the panel members. So please, uh, throughout the course of the program, take advantage of that. So John, uh, can you address Rule 53? I know that uh, you'll tell us how it deals with the, um, the rules regarding uh, uh, treating uh, physicians and treating experts and, and the difficulties that, uh, that it's causing in our practices. Uh, thanks, Jimmy. Just to refresh everyone's memory, feel, Rule 53 lays out the requirements of uh, what it takes for an expert witness to give opinion evidence, and that's the difference between an expert and a lay uh, individual. An expert can give their opinion, whereas a lay person cannot. And most uh, healthcare professionals are considered experts and can give opinion uh, within their field. And this has been a evolving or changing process as to what is and what isn't <coughs> required and what experts can do and the reason we put this uh, subject on on the program for this morning is there has been yet another change in what is required and that is uh, came out in a case called Westerhoff versus G it is a divisional court case which is higher than the other superior court decisions that, which we've been dealing with and it essentially, it essentially said that a, a, you have to comply with, with Rule 5303. 
and you have to deliver a, a, a Form 53. And up until that decision, there was a bit of wiggle room with, with treating health professionals. For example, a psychologist or an occupational therapist might deliver ongoing progress reports, and they could, they could give opinion evidence um, within their field with, without uh, complying with, with Rule 53. So Westerhoff has changed that, and it says you must comply with Rule 5303, and that means we, as lawyers, have to send you a letter that com also complies with Rule 53, and your response has to uh, comply and conform with, with Rule 53. So, and if you've, any of you have got uh, letters from us, you'll see that the requirements are complex and, and crazy, and you would have to ask yourself, why, why are the lawyers writing to me a letter like this when they've got six or seven detailed uh, progress <coughs> reports? <clears throat> so that's, that's what Westerhoff says, is, is, is you do need to comply with Rule 53 and, and deliver the form. Now, there, <clears throat> there is a little bit of wiggle room, a little bit, maybe, maybe. And it says this. It says a, a treating health professional uh, can talk about the treatment they're providing to the injured individual. Uh, they can talk about their observations. And it also says this, to the extent that they need to talk about a diagnosis to t in order to talk about their, their treatment and their observations, they can do so without a, a Form 53 and without complying with the rules. So, so at first blush, the rule seems to be stricter that you do need a Form 53 and comply with the rules, but there is that little bit of, of, of wiggle room. And <clears throat> so the consequences to us as lawyers and to you as health professionals, well, basically, we're going to beg. Uh, we're going to beg for Form 53s and the answer in these letters so that we don't have any issues uh, in, in court. And it might mean, it might mean less, less treating health care prof professionals if, if we can't get them to comply with Rule 53 and more hired guns, which I would find quite, quite sad because I think the treating health professionals are in the best position to, to assist the, 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 the judge and the jury. And those are my comments, Jim. Thanks. Thanks, John. And uh, in that case, if I uh, read it correctly, the consequences were rather dramatic to the plaintiff in that case because uh, a number of uh, treating professionals, in fact, weren't allowed to give evidence, which would have caught, caught their lawyer by surprise, wouldn't it? A absolutely, it would. And that, that decision uh, is the lawyers are looking for leave to appeal that decision, uh, but there's nothing, there's no date or anything for, for that leave application. And, and, John, this is perhaps a bit premature because we haven't gone through all of our panelists, but it's a timely question that just came in uh, from uh, one of our viewers. Can you give us an idea of what is required in compliance with Rule 53? Oof. Um, you, you don't want to know. Uh, but, no, I, I, I can. W one of the things you have to do is sign the form, which, which I think everyone knows about. It's a, it's a specified form, and with the rule itself, we, we as lawyers have to send out a letter uh, asking certain very specific questions of you, and I'll, I'll just, I'll tell you, I'll tell you some of the, some of the, the requirements. We have to, we have to put in our letter the instructions in our letter to you that we're asking for, what exactly is it we're asking for, um, uh, y your reasons for the opinion, <clears throat> if you make any assumptions, factual assumptions on which the opinion is based, uh, we need that. Uh, a list of every document that you, you've relied on. If, if you're used to these letters, uh, they're, not, they're not that bad, but to be a treating health professional and just, just get one of these letters, you know, why is he asking me all these crazy questions about my assumptions and whatnot? It can be 
quite onerous, but but in a letter that we will send to you, we will we will list all all the requirements, and I've I've just given some of them. Great, thanks, John. <clears throat> we'll now um, call on Dr. Xiao to uh, uh, talk about some recent advances in technology that uh, Council may find useful and that the healthcare people may find useful uh, in the course of assisting in the management of our clients' uh, rehabilitation. Dr. Xiao? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Good uh, morning, everybody. Um, I'm Yinhui Xiao, and uh, I'm the Director of Nuclear Medicine at uh, South Lake Regional Health Center in Newmarket. I'm, a ge I'm, I'm a, both a radiologist and a, a nuclear medicine specialist. Um, so uh, about this time, this is where I'm supposed to make my statement of uh, financial disclosures, and I can confidently say I don't have any financial disclosures. I wish I had some financial disclosures uh, to, to, to make, and um, I find that that's an area I'm sorely lacking experience in. Um, so just a, just a few quick um, facts about the brain. So the brain is an organ that weighs about three pounds and uh, is, is a primarily fatty organ. Um, it has a consistency, a consistency of soft tofu, and uh, it also takes five parts of the brain to laugh at a given joke. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, just three ways of, uh, of uh, imaging the brain. That's using CT, MRI, nuclear medicine. I'll give a, br a brief introduction on each one. I'll show how, or I'll, I'll give, it, I'll let you know how I think everything should fit in terms of imaging the brain uh, during uh, in brain trauma, and I'll give you some examples as well. So CT stands for uh, com computerized tomography. The old name is computerized axial tomography, and that's where the whole CAT scan uh, terminology came in. Here's a picture of a typical uh, CT machine, and, and what you see is the bed where, where you lie, uh, where, where, where you lie on, and the gantry where that, you, that you fit in head first, and that's, uh, that's the gantry that takes the images of your head. Here are some typical images uh, from a CT head, and what you can see is the, the white part at the periphery, and that's the skull. You can see the grayer, the grayer material in, in the center, which is, which is the, the actual brain, and you can see the darker parts within the brain, which is uh, the more fluid-filled spaces in the brain. So while you can, so I'll, I'll just point out that while you can see the skull, you can differentiate between the skull and the brain, for example, if you actually look at the brain itself, it, it's kind of like a, just a, a gray mishmash, and it's difficult to pick out actual internal structures within the brain itself. The advantages of CT are, is, are that it's very common, they're very common. Just about every hospital in, uh, in Ontario has a CT machine, which means that this technology is very readily accessible. The scans are also very fast. The uh, a typical scan of the head takes somewhere between five to 10 seconds. So, so it actually takes much longer for the patient to actually walk into the room, get prepared, and walk out than to have the actual study being done. The disadvantages are that it uses ionizing radiation. Uh, now, the ionizing radiation is the one that you, you, you kind of worry about that makes your hair fall out or that, that it's going to give you cancer. And a CAT scan or a CT scan uses lots of it. It also shows primarily anatomic structures. So what that means is that you can see stuff, but it doesn't tell you very well how well it doesn't tell you very well how well that body part is working. Um, also, depending on the body part, there's also limited differentiation between different body structures. So like I said, you can tell the difference between the skull and the brain, but looking at the brain itself, it's difficult to pick out uh, the, its internal structures. Another way of looking at the brain is with MRI. Now, MRI stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging, and ultimately this is a machine that produces images from magnetic fields and radio waves. So as a result, it has no ionizing radiation. Here's a typical picture of what uh, an MRI machine looks like. So again, um, it's in, it looks similar to the CT machine in that there's a bed and that you go head in first into, into the gantry. The gantry, however, is a lot, uh, is a lot longer. So they're typically uh, six feet long and, uh, and it's also a lot narrower. So, uh, so claustrophobia becomes a much bigger issue. Um, these are typical uh, pictures from an MRI of the brain. And, um, and, and these are two different what's called sequences or types. Um, I'm just showing them just to, to, to make two points. If you look at the upper part of the pictures, you see, you'll see the eyeballs. And on the picture on the, on the left, the eyeballs are white. And the picture on the right, the eyeballs are, are dark. And that's just to say that even though we're looking at eyeballs, they look different. So these pictures show different things. The other thing is that if you look, at, if you actually look at the brain now, you can you can see a lot more um, internal structures. So if you look at the periphery of the brain, that's the gray matter with the thinking part. Um, you can tell the you can pick it pick it out much better uh, from the from the more central white matter, which is a, which is a darker part on both uh, on both images. 
Another advantage of MRI is that, uh, is that you can get what's called different planes. So on the previous pictures I showed you, those pictures were as if the patient is lying down and you're standing at their feet looking up at them. In the picture on the, on the left, it's as if you're looking at the patient from their side and, and the patient is looking towards the left. In the picture on the right, it's as if the patient is looking at you, and uh, and so up is up, down is down, and th uh, the the left of the picture is actually um, is sorry the 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 right of the picture is their left, and the left of the picture is actually your right. Um, the advantages of MRI is that uh, it's got really high resolution, which means that you can see small things well. It's also got good contrast, so, so an example of contrast would be it's much easier to see a, a black bear on a, on a white glacier than to see a white polar bear on a white glacier. It's got a great deal of flexibility and potential. Most of the research papers in, in radiology these days deal with MRI and how people are finding new ways to use the hardware and the, and, and, and the software and, and, its, and its applications. It also has no ionizing radiation, which is, which is the type of radiation that people are worried about that, that'll give you cancer. Um, now, the thing is, MRI, though, does not come in only one flavor. And this is just a list of the different sequences that, uh, that, that you can put or that, that's required to, to make an MRI study. Um, what I like to do is compare this to, to sort of baking a cake, and, and these are the different ingredients that you can have, that you can put in the cake. So that means also that if you're looking for a vanilla cake, you, you need to know the ingredients, otherwise you might end up with chocolate. Here's an example of, uh, of, of, a, of uh, differences in sequences. Um, these, uh, these images uh, are, are used to pick up uh, previous bleeding in the brain. So the, uh, the picture on the, on the far left and the picture second from the right are what's called gradient echo images. And these are, then this is an older sequence to pick up previous bleeding in the brain. The picture on the far right is, uh, is what's called an SWI or a susceptibility weighted imaging uh, image. And, uh, and if you look at the two pictures on the right, you can see that uh, uh, you can see that the one on the far right, there's a lot more darker parts within the brain and also uh, and also just off to the side. These are areas of these are areas of previous hemorrhage, which on the adjacent picture you don't see as well. So again, if you're looking for evidence of previous bleeding in the brain, if you do a gradient echo sequence, your sensitivity for picking up this, this bleeding becomes less. Now the dis disadvantages of MRI uh, are that it has very long imaging time. So I mentioned that a CAT scan or a CT scan takes somewhere between 5 to 10 seconds to, to look at the brain. Um, MRI of the brain starts at 20 minutes. Now in that 20 minutes, you're lying, you're, you have to be lying very still. You're lying in this, in this very claustrophobic, very long tunnel, which a lot of people uh, uh, akin to either a coffin or a tomb. So, so claustrophobia can be a big problem. The, uh, the MRIs are expensive to buy and they're, they're expensive to maintain. And because they use large, powerful magnets, um, you have, the, there, there are issues with, uh, with uh, surgical clips. So for example, aneurysm clips in the brain is a, is a contraindication to going in, in an MRI. And similarly, pacemakers as well is, a, is another contraindication. Now, nuclear medicine is the last uh, thing I want to talk about to, to in, in, in terms of a way to look at the brain. And now, nuclear medicine is uh, an imaging modality, so, uh, so it takes pictures, and it uses radioactive tracers. What we do is we give these radioactive tracers, either inject or, or orally, and they go to different parts of the body. What nuclear medicine does is it looks at the physiology of a body part as opposed to the anatomy. So, so it looks at how well something is working as opposed to how big something is. The example I, I, I usually give is for something like a, a CT or an MRI, it'll tell you how big a tumor is, but in nuclear medicine, will tell you how much of the tumor is alive. Um, now, brain in brain spec, what we're looking at is brain perfusion. Um, I'll show you some pictures in a minute, but you'll see some dark spots and some light spots. So the bright, so the, the the brighter the the image or the amount of activity is proportional to the blood flow. It's perfusion. Uh, so perfusion is how well uh, is how much blood the, the the brain is getting. Okay. So so the brighter parts on the picture, the brighter part of the picture means that that part of the brain is getting more of blood flow. Um, and blood flow is proportional to use. So what that means is that if you use uh, a part of your brain more, it's going to look brighter on the picture. SPECT is an acronym, um, which just allows us, to, once again, to get different planes or slices similar to, to the MRI. So here are some, so here are typical uh, pictures of the brain. And, uh, and it's a very colorful picture. And once again, you see, you see 
bright spots and dark spots. So again, the brighter spots are the areas of the brain that are getting more blood or are getting more use. Um, and, and you'll see you'll see that this in, in the brain it primarily occurs around the periphery. This is the gray matter, which is a thinking part of the brain. It's uh, that that's the part that, of the brain that does the most work, so therefore it gets the most blood. The the more central parts of the brain are the more uh, sort of transition uh, transitional uh, parts of the brain that transmit the thoughts. So as a result, they don't do as much work and they they, they don't require as much blood. The disadvantages of, of nuclear medicine is that there is that you see the, uh, the the part of the body that you want to see quite well. However, there's a lack of surrounding structures. So in the case of the brain, we see the brain, but we don't see the skull or the scalp, for example. Also, um, there you can have a similar appearance to different types of pathologies. So in terms of well, which how do I take a picture of the brain in uh, in, in brain trauma, or when do I use what in in brain injury? What I would suggest is that um, for a CT of the brain, you use it in the in initial assessment acutely after trauma. So this is usually done in the minutes to hours after uh, trauma has occurred. And the big decision at that point is, do I need a brain surgeon right now? Um, see, the CT of the head can also be used for follow-up studies for abnormalities that were, were initially seen because of its, because of its ability to, uh, of widespread access and the speed of, uh, of being able to obtain a study. MRI, I would suggest to use in terms of further assessment of the brain injury not originally seen on, on CT. Also, if you're, if, you, if you're suspecting brain injury, um, it's, it's a much more sensitive way of detecting brain injury. It also gives you a better idea of the extent of injury. And, 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 and typically, you would employ MRI in, the day, in, in days or weeks or months following the brain injury. Spec, spec brain or nuclear medicine brain, again, um, talks about the functional assessment of the brain, so how well the brain is working, as, a, as opposed to how big it is or, how, or what it's looking like at the time. And, uh, and, and, and typically, this is, this is used months to years after, after the initial uh, trauma has been treated and things have settled down. So ideally, um, uh, to, to, to image the brain, what I would suggest is to, is, to, is to put MRI together with a brain spec because with the MRI imaging, you get very good anatomic imaging. You, you're able to detect the presence of old blood. And with the spec imaging, you can see the functional imaging or how well a part of the brain is, is working. Um, the MRI also allows direct visualization of damage and, it, and it, it can also pick out the presence of other pathologies that, uh, that the brain spec could, could miss or could, could have a similar appearance uh, for, uh, for, for other things. So really the two things together are, are much better than, uh, the, than, their, than their different parts. Um, so I'm just going just to show uh, two examples to help hopefully illustrate uh, what I'm talking about. So here's a, here's a very typical case, 20-year-old male, MVA six years ago, now presents with headaches, cognitive difficulties, vision difficulties, and short-term memory loss. Um, and, uh, and so here, is, uh, here are two brain specs. The picture on the right, actually, is, is a normal brain, and the patient's uh, brain spec is on the left. And if I, if, if I just point out the areas of the arrows, those arrows are pointing to the inferior medial aspects of the, of, of the temporal lobes. And normally what you would see on this plane, which is the coronal plane, so you're looking, so it's, it's as if the patient is looking at you, you see a nice ring at the, at the inferior temporal lobes. On the, on the, on the patient's uh, scan, you're actually, it, there's actually decreased perfusion or not as bright, so those parts of the brain are not working as well. Um, in terms of pattern, this part of the brain is also very susceptible or very commonly injured in brain injury because of its, because of its, of its, uh, of its um, appearance and its location um, adjacent to the skull. Um, the picture on the right is a, is a brain speck and the picture on the left is an MRI showing the, using the susceptibility weighted uh, sequence. So um, those arrows on the picture on the left point to dark spots. Those dark spots are areas of previous hemorrhage. So this, 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 uh, this guy has had previous bleeding in that part of his brain. This also corresponds to the picture on the right where those arrows are pointing towards a darker area. So that, again, that part of the brain, which is the, which is the medial part of the left temporal lobe, is not working as well. And these two pictures show that, well, it's not working as well, and I suspect it's because he's had brain injury there because He's had previous bleeding, which in that site, which shouldn't should not be there. 
just a slightly um, uh, different slices here. Um, again, the picture on the left, I'm, th that arrow is pointing to a dark spot. That spot is, uh, is again an area of previous bleeding that's, that has occurred in the, uh, the posterior part of the, of the left corpus callosum. If you look on the, on the brain spec image on the right, this is, a much, this is a much softer call and actually shows up much better on the monitors I have at work than, than here. But, but it's, it, that area points again to, a, to a, a slightly darker spot, which again means uh, that that part of the brain is not working as well as compared to the other side. Um, so the findings in this particular case are that you have decreased perfusion in the temporal lobes on the brain spec, and that's and as I said, that 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 uh, location is very, very is very typical for previous brain trauma, and there's also evidence of previous hemorrhage in the left temporal lobe in the area of what looks like well, what looks like uh, decreased function on the brain spec, and these combination of findings are very typical of previous brain injury. Um, example two. Uh, I have a 32-year-old male with a, who was a motorcycle driver in an MVC one year ago and now again presents with cognitive difficulties. Um, now, the, now these findings here were a little bit uh, were a little bit more subtle. So um, looking at the looking at the arrows, what what I saw was was mildly decreased perfusion or, or areas that were not quite as bright at the inferior parts of the left frontal lobe. So what that means is that in that part of the brain of the left frontal lobe, it's not working as well as, as either on the other side or what I think normal should be. Um, also, if, uh, if, if you look at the arrow on these pictures here, what it's pointing to is a, is a perfusion defect in the medial part of the right temporal lobe. So again, this area is very commonly involved with, uh, with, uh, with brain trauma. The problem, though, that is, was that these findings on the on, on the scan were 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 more subtle than the than than the, than the previous study, and so and so uh, my confidence in terms of finding of, of of picking out these abnormalities was was only moderate, until, however, I was given um, a picture of uh, of this CT of the head, and what this points to that arrow is that you is is uh, is that I'm pointing to, to to a little buckle in the bone in the lateral part of the left orbit, and what this means is that. And it is that this person struck their head on the left side of the uh, struck their head on the on the left side, and they struck it hard enough to be able to buckle the lateral wall of the orbit. So the, so there is a fracture there. So suddenly this in combination with the with the brain spec puts everything together. So I think this person here struck his head on the left side with enough force to to, to break the lateral part of his of his uh, of his bone there. And as a result, damaged the inferior part of his left frontal lobe, and had a contracoup injury on the right medial temporal lobe. This the, the whole pattern fits together very well for for previous brain injury again. So um, just a summary of the findings: mild decreased activity, inferior left frontal lobe, and the right temporal lobe. The brain MRI in this case was normal. However, the previous CT uh, exam shows, shows a fracture to the left uh, lateral wall. All of these findings put together. Um, uh, describes a direct impact on the left head with a contracoup injury in the left temporal lobe. Um, so my conclusions from all this are that a normal CT head does not mean that there has been no brain trauma. Brain spec and brain MRI um, uh, separately are useful in the detection of previous brain trauma, but however, together, their sum is much greater than their separate parts. And that's the end of my talk. Well, wow, fascinating, Dr. Xiao. Thank you very much. We've uh, had a number of questions come in, but I'll save them for later in the program. Okay. Roger, you've uh, you've made it safe and sound, thankfully, uh, and barely. Uh, have you had any time to put some thoughts together on whether there's been any new issues coming up in auto insurance? Thanks, Jim. Um, the uh, drive down this morning was certainly. Uh, Certainly historic and epic from my perspective, but I but I am here uh, after uh, making my way past not one but three collisions on the 400. Um, there have been very few uh, real case law changes uh, that uh, you should be aware of uh, since our last webinar. webinar. <coughs> And I know the greatest concern uh, that you have and that we have uh, is what's happening uh, with catastrophic impairment and that definition. So I'll just do a very brief review of the immediate history and then I'll um, 
tell you what our best sense is of, of where we are at the moment. Uh, it's hard to believe that it was three years ago in November of 2010 that the so-called expert panel uh, was struck and uh, members were appointed to it. And it's um, just as hard to believe that in June of 2011, uh, almost two and a half years ago, uh, we uh, received the expert panel's report. Now, you will remember there was a lot of concern at that point and concern about the process, concern about who was appointed, and uh, particularly uh, was there uh, concern with respect to many of the aspects uh, of the recommendations. Uh, the next stage uh, following the release of that report was in June of 2012, that was another year later, um, of the superintendent's uh, report, that's the superintendent of FISCO, um, on the expert panel review. Uh, that report made recommendations to the government on the redefinition, uh, the rewording of catastrophic, and we were all on the edge of our seats waiting for that, that report. Um, what I can tell you, and you're probably aware of this, is that none of the recommendations from this report have been uh, implemented so far. And then uh, in March of this year, um, the Minister of uh, Finance uh, s struck a, a roundtable uh, stakeholder discussion group. Uh, it was um, to deal specifically with the definition of uh, catastrophic impairment. And that uh, report uh, has been drafted but not released. Um, I, I have uh, spoken to someone who has seen it, and um, I'm told that it is merely an overview of the various positions and, and uh, opinions uh, that came from stakeholder groups. <clears throat> and that roundtable um, stakeholder uh, process does not, uh, has not resulted in any proposals for change. So um, where are we at the moment? Um, in politics, of course, none of us know for sure, but our best sense is that the redefinition of catastrophic impairment is not a high priority for the government uh, despite what we uh, believe to be the continuing pressure from our friends in the industry uh, to uh, restrict catastrophic impairment still further. And this at a time when um, benefits for non-catastrophically impaired uh, accident victims have been drastically uh, lowered, as we all know. What uh, we do know is that in a uh, policy statement released by the government in August of this year, uh, catastrophic impairment was mentioned uh, in the context that the government would be looking at a new approach for review in the fall. Uh, well, it is the fall, and we're certainly not aware of anything by way of a new approach uh, being uh, uh, put forward at this time. There are many um, other auto insurance industry issues which appear uh, to be uh, more pressing, uh, to us at least, um, uh, both for the industry uh, and the government uh, than the redefinition of catastrophic impairment. Those issues are the 15% reduction in, in um, premium levels, which is, I suspect we'll hear, going to be a huge challenge for the industry. 
the review of the dispute resolution system uh, at Fisco, uh, which, as you know, has already gone some sig undergone significant changes. Uh, those issues um, and other pressing policy matters, including the uh, protocol for the min minor injury treatment, um, and coming up uh, is the next three-year uh, review of auto. Um, all of those, we suspect, uh, will eclipse efforts to rework uh, the CAT defi definition, at least um, and especially because we are uh, not long uh, before uh, we are into a pre-election time frame again. Um, our, our sense is that uh, the uh, ministry and the current minister um, are not persuaded that further restrictions to the catastrophic impairment definition are um, a necessary part of the cost savings needed uh, to reduce premium levels. We also sense that there may be very little appetite for the government to be seen to be bending to the industry um, and demands for further savings at this point. So uh, our sense of it, and it's just an impression, um, as we've all put our heads together to try and get a sense of what's going on, is that the redefinition of catastrophic impairment is not the prior priority uh, that it once was uh, back when we were all so concerned about uh, the changes that might take place. If I have uh, another minute, Jim, I will just mention very briefly one case that you may uh, find uh, worth taking a look at. And that is an arbitration decision uh, recently uh, 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 heard um, in a case called Mujku, M-U-J-K-U, and State Farm. And it was um, all about how one uh, determines whether uh, an accident victim has sustained a marked impairment. And of course, um, that's become a huge issue for you and for us as lawyers since the Pastor decision. Now, interestingly, the um, arbitrator in that case um, relied squarely on Pastor. And we were told by this decision that there are three questions that have to be asked in making the decision about market impairment, and they have to uh, follow this specific order. The first question is, did the accident cause the injured person to suffer a mental or behavioral disorder? That is the first step. And if the answer to that's no, then the rest of the questions are irrelevant. But if the answer is yes, the second question is what's the impact of the mental or behavioral disorder on the person's daily life? And then the third question is in view of that impact, what is the level of the impairment? Uh, that's the only case that um, I intend to refer to, and I hope that the uh, update on catastrophic impairment at least uh, gives us all a sense of where we are on that critical issue at the moment. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, uh, Roger. Glad you could make it safe and sound. And it's a, a refreshing change not to have to uh, respond to uh, sudden initiatives on catastrophic impairment, and it seems as if for the moment uh, we're letting a sleeping dog lie. Well, now I think the table has been set for us to hear uh, a perspective that might be somewhat different. Uh, Barb uh, Solzenko Lori from the IBC has volunteered, or perhaps has been volunteered, 
to be with us today. And uh, Barb, we, we thank you for coming into the lion's den. Um, and we'd like to uh, now have your perspective from the insurance industry on uh, how you feel the system's working, what are the problems, uh, what initiatives do you see are important um, to move forward on. And so I'll turn it over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Jim, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I'm from the Insurance Bureau of Canada, which is uh, uh, commonly known as uh, IBC, and we're the National Trade Association for the Canadian property and casualty insurance industry. Uh, w most of the companies that, uh, that uh, write the property and casualty insurance are members of uh, IBC, although not all of them are. Um, the topic of, uh, of my remarks um, is uh, an insurance perspective on the state of the PNC insurance industry. So um, uh, taking that title as uh, my lead, I'll start with a few comments on the uh, broader economic environment that uh, insurance companies are operating in. Uh, generally, the uh, Canadian PNC industry's performance is linked uh, to the performance of the, the uh, Canadian economy, so that when the economy is growing, uh, premium revenue grows. But as we all know, uh, economic activity in Canada and most other uh, developed country, uh, economies has uh, been slow and uncertain since the financial crisis of 2008-09. However, it is beginning to look as though there is a light at the end of the tunnel. Starting in the second half of 2013 and moving into 2014, most economists are expecting stronger global growth supported by strengthening in advanced economies. Of particular interest to Canada, in 2014, the U.S. is expected to reach its long-run average growth rate of 3 percent. Uh, many analysts believe that this will spur demand for Canadian exports and, along with support from ongoing low interest rates, pave the way for economic growth from the second half of 2013 to the end of 2015. So all other things being equal, this is, of course, good news for the insurance industry. Turning to interest rates, um, industry investments are concentrated in government and highly rated corporate bonds. This means that investment returns tend to reflect yields on Government of Canada three to five year uh, bonds. Over the past 20 years, the yields on these investments have been uh, falling with interest rates. Thanks to the financial crisis and government's efforts to spur a recovery, the past few years have seen interest rates fall to and remain at record low levels. In this country, the Bank of Canada has maintained a target overnight rate of 1 percent for more than three years, and it's, it is expected to remain at that level through 2014. Recently, yields on some bonds uh, have started to rise, and uh, even if this development sig signals an upward trend, we expect it will be gradual. Now, during periods of low investment returns, uh, discipline under, un underwriting for the insurance industry is critical for insurance companies uh, to earn a competitive return on their equity. Another very important development that is affecting the state of PNC insurance is the trend to more frequent and more severe weather events, which most people are attributing to the higher temperatures associated with climate change. These events have been wreaking havoc on the industry's underwriting results. 2013 will be the fifth year in a row that insured losses from catastrophic weather events were close to or higher than a billion dollars in Canada. In fact, because of the southern Alberta flood and the July rainstorms in the greater Toronto area, 2013 will mark the most expensive year in terms of these insured losses. During the first nine months of the year, insured losses from catastrophic weather events totaled almost $3 billion. So what do these developments and trends mean for the industry's financial results? Between the first half of, of 2012 and the first half of 2013, claims costs in increased 8.4 percent, far outstripping the 2.5 uh, percent growth in premium volume. This underwriting performance combined with flat investment returns to produce an esti estimated industry-wide return on equity of 8.6 percent at mid-year. 
this key metric was down from 11.1 percent in the first half of 2012. Now, turning to Ontario auto insurance, the um, auto insurance market in Ontario is the largest PNC insurance market in the country. Ontario Auto makes up 56% of the $21 billion PNC market in the province of Ontario and 26% of the of $46 billion total market in Canada. There are 90 companies selling auto insurance in this province. So what happens in Ontario Auto is a big deal for the industry. For more than a decade, the gap between the price of auto insurance in Ontario and the prices in the other provinces where private companies sell auto insurance has been widening. As of uh, July 2013, the average price of auto insurance in Ontario was $1,525. That's 40% higher than in Alberta, 43% higher than in Newfoundland and Labrador, and then we go up to 96% higher than in New, uh, New Brunswick, 98% higher than in, in Nova Scotia, and 103% higher than the prices that uh, drivers in Prince Edward Island pay for auto insurance. Consumers in Ontario spend 5.3% of their average disposable income on auto insurance. In uh, Alberta and Atlantic Canada, the comparison numbers are only 2.8 and 3.2% uh, respectively. The reason prices are this high in Ontario is because claims costs, especially injury claims costs, are high. In 2012, the average cost of a bodily injury claim in Ontario was $157,000. In Alberta, the average cost of these claims was 50000 and in Atlantic Canada, it was 49,000, that is in comparison to 157,000 in Ontario. For accident benefits coverage, two years after the 2010 SABS reforms, the average cost of a claim in Ontario was nearly $27,000. And this compares with average uh, costs for uh, no fault injury claims in Alberta of $3,600 and in Atlantic Canada of $7,700, again, compared with $27,000 in Ontario. The Ontario government brought in the 2010 reforms to stabilize rapidly escalating SABS claims costs. The major components of the reforms included limiting med rehab benefits for people with minor injuries to $3,500, capping the cost of medical assessments at $2,000, for people with minor injury and non-catastrophic injuries, reducing maximum med rehab benefits from $100,000 to $50,000 and reducing attending care benefits for these claimants, as well as various other uh, cost-saving measures. For the industry, as we have already heard from Roger, um, it is significant that for people whose injuries are deemed catastrophic, the reforms did not change benefit levels or eligibility requirements. Figures from the General Insurance Statistical Agency, um, uh, otherwise known as GISA, which is the data collector for the regulators in Ontario, Alberta, and, uh, and Atlantic Canada, show that the immediate effect of the SABS reforms has been in indeed very positive. For collisions that happened in 2012, the accident benefits claims cost of per vehicle was $247, and that's more than 50% lower than for collisions that happened in 2010. Now, with these results, I imagine that many in the audience are probably thinking that since the reforms, insurance companies have been enabled to make billions of dollars in profits. Wish they had, but they have not. In the first place, very significant savings were needed simply to align costs with premiums. That's because when the reforms were implemented, premium levels were lagging behind claims costs by 15 to 20 percent. That year, insurance companies lost $1.8 billion on the Ontario auto insurance market. Secondly, History has taught the lesson that the cost structure of auto insurance in Ontario is very vulnerable to precedent-setting legal interpretations. 
as you know, thousands of claims uh, since the 2010 reforms have been tied up with a massive dispute resolution backlog at Fisco. Only recently have arbitrators and the courts started adjudicating disputes over the main cost containment provisions in the 2010 reforms. Depending upon the outcomes of these processes, the cost of SAB's claims could again be driven up and, along with any retroactive impact, wipe out the cost savings and then some. But potentially adverse adjudication outcomes on SAB's claims are far from being the only significant source of cost uncertainty that Ontario's auto insurers are currently facing. For example, we have uh, alluded to the government not making any changes to the SAB's treatment of catastrophic impairment. This issue is still awaiting action, and um, the, despite a great deal of concern that the SAB's definition of cat impairment has become much more porous than it was ever intended to be. For a variety of reasons, it is very difficult to collect data on trends in the number and types of cat claims over a short period of time. However, we do have indirect evidence and insurer reports that the proportion of injury claims that are seeking CAT status is climbing. This is not surprising given the lack of clarity in the current definition and the significant benefit to claimants and the representatives of having their injury declared to be catastrophic. On the other hand, it simply doesn't make sense that injuries would be becoming more severe given the many improvements in road safety and also um, in the high-end quality of uh, medical care. Needle needless to say, the potential for a growing number of CAT claims remains a significant source of concern to insurers. And yet a further source of pressure on claims costs is being faced by insurers from the bodily injury side of the insurance product. In 2008, when the government announced its decision to reform accident benefits coverage, Barb Addy, who is an actuary with Barron Insurance Services, noted that the savings on the AB side will be largely eaten up by increases on the tort side. Ms. Addy's comments have since proven to have been uh, prophetic. For collisions that happened in 2012, the bodily injury claims cost per vehicle was $365. That's 38% higher than for collisions that happened in 2008 and represents more than $765 million in additional claims costs. To what degree the several factors I have mentioned will erode the cost savings achieved to date is anyone's guess. Insurance companies are in the risk management business. They work and thrive in an uncertain environment and some are willing to take a calculated risk on the 2010 uh, reforms continuing to contain costs over the long run. But to change prices, insurance companies have to get approval from Fisco. While Fisco is likely to approve a price reduction rather quickly, it can take months before it approves a price increase, even if the worst fears for a rapid uh, return of uh, cost escalation were to be realized. You often hear the government talk about its premium and cost reduction strategy. It's the plan to have companies reduce premiums by 15 percent by August uh, 2015. But the cost reduction components of the strategy that have been announced so far are unlikely to take effect until close to or after that date. Without measures to secure the savings from the SABS reforms, and to address the other sources of cost pressure on injury claims, insurers will continue to operate in a very risky auto insurance market in Ontario. But it shouldn't be this way. From my perspective, there's no logical reason why drivers in Ontario should have to pay so much more for insurance than their counterparts in the other uh, Canadian provinces. Thank you. Great. Great. Uh uh, Barb, thanks very much for uh, providing us with a perspective that we've uh, not had an opportunity to present at our prior webinars. And uh, just because I'm chair, I get an opportunity to see if anybody wants to respond to that. And uh, I'm going to ask Dale if he's got any comments. Um, I've got a few, Jim. I, um, of course, don't have all of the actuarial data that, that Barb has, um, but going back to my my days as OATLA president and when I did work with um, 
with the IBC on some of the reforms. Some of the old conversations come to mind, <coughs> like we, we do hear about economic conditions. And of course, we all know that, that there are cycles in the economy. There's good times and there's bad times. And um, from the perspective of, of the advocate for, for victims uh, of car crashes, um, we speak about insurers having discipline. Um, underwriting discipline in the good times. And oftentimes um, um, the insurance crises that we see are as a result of a lack of discipline in underwriting in those good times because insurers are relying on their uh, economic return on investment. Um, and I think traditionally and historically the auto product was a bit of a loss leader. They, the insurers weren't um, and Barb, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but insurers did not expect to make an underwriting profit on the auto product itself because there were so, such strong um, return on investment. And I think that's changed in recent years. In fact, insurers now do expect um, uh, an, uh, an underwriting profit on the auto product, and they have seen that in recent times. If I could just make a little comment on that. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, and certainly during the 1990s, you know, when the uh, investment markets were doing so well, um, the uh, returns on investment were, were actually subsidizing the auto product uh, through, throughout much of the country. Um, over the last 20, 25 years, though, interest rates have been falling, and we're a very interest-sensitive <laughs> industry, and we are because of our, um, the, most of our investments being in bonds. and is the solvency regulators have become much, much stricter in terms of the investments that they allow us to make, that dependency on, on bonds, right. particularly government bonds and highly rated corporate bonds, has increased. Right. I, so but, but the result of that, the result of that is that there is less investment uh, income to subsidize Sure. Uh, auto insurance um, than has been the case in the past. Right, but my, my point, Barb, is if you're looking historically at the health of the auto industry, the fact of the matter is the there is an underwriting profit now where historically and traditionally there hadn't been. When we look at average on price of, a, of the Ontario product being higher than the other provinces, um, we did see a dramatic uh, and, and in some people would suggest draconian cuts to the auto product in order to bring that back in line, which um, is really a blunt, a very blunt approach, a blunt instrument to deal with, with um, you know, a targeted problem, and there should have been a targeted solution. You know, with the ma vast majority of people that suffer um, injuries in auto accidents, they went from um, from having hundred thousand dollars in medical and rehabilitation benefits available to them down to thirty five hundred because the majority of people suffered non-catastrophic injuries in car accidents, and now the majority of people who suffer those injuries are placed into the MEG, um, rather than taking a much, probably a more difficult path, but a targeted solution, looking at things like, um, for sure, there, there is fraud within the system, there's towing and storage issues, um, and there's also significant insurer in, um, inefficiency, because you do see such a wide variability in profitability between different insurers within the same market. How do you have the cooperators of the world making significant profit and the state farms of the world having significant losses in Ontario Auto when they're selling the exact same product and everybody's living under the same rules? So sure there is there are different, you know, different clientele, but I think when you're looking at um, um, uh, a solution to a problem, uh, and we, we all have to live with those September 2010 changes, but that was a very blunt approach. And the focus since that point has seemed to shift to, to catastrophic. And when I was involved in speaking to the finance ministry on this issue, I said, well, that, that seems to be a solution to a problem that just doesn't exist because there was no data available from the IBC or from any of the insurers that suggested there was a dramatic increase in the number of catastrophic impairment claims or people being deemed catastrophic, and there was no evidence at all to suggest that um, there was dramatic claims costs increases associated with catastrophic impairment claims. The, the statistics seem to be actually quite flat or, or even slightly decreasing in terms of the number of people who had been deemed catastrophic. And we all know, of course, that a catastrophic designation doesn't actually equate to claims costs, that it's a two-step process, and simply because you've been deemed catastrophic, you still 
are required to prove that any item or service is reasonable and necessary. We could um, uh, debate our numbers <laughs> <laughs> forever, but I, th I think it's rather interesting, just, uh, just one case in point, you, know, you refer to the um, $3,500 cap on minor injuries uh, for SABS claims. Um, and uh, and uh, as though that's a draconian cut. And um, in the case of Alberta, where uh, they, there is no uh, uh, minor injury uh, cap, you know, for on, on uh, no fault uh, benefits, so the, the entire range of uh, injuries that are are covered by uh, a no fault uh, injury benefits. The average claim is uh, thirty-six hundred dollars. Mm. Here we're talking about in Ontario, we're talking about only minor injuries. That's sprain and strain injuries, okay, and a cap of thirty-five hundred dollars on sprain and strain injuries. So uh, you know that hardly sounds uh, draconian when in Alberta they're able to accommodate the entire range of injuries, okay, within an average cost of uh, thirty-six hundred dollars. Okay, so. We'll move forward with some of the questions that we've, uh, we've had. Uh, and I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Xiao um, from Michelle. Many clients will have numerous brain injuries over a period of years. Which of these scans would be most beneficial to determining new versus older injuries to the brain? Mm -hmm. And, of course, that's so important for all of us in our business because we, of course, can only get funding for those injuries that are found as a uh, to have occurred as a result of the subject accident. Yeah, um, I, I think unfortunately, um, the, uh, through a combination of both the imaging and the way the brain heals, um, it, it, just from a single study, it's, not, it's very difficult to tell the chronology of, uh, of, 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 a, of a particular injury, um, or at least after the acute event. After the acute event, it's very difficult to tell uh, the chronology of an injury. The best way, actually, is to have a series of studies and to, to look for a change. Um, so, if so, so as an example, if um, if there's evidence of uh, of an injury like now, you can't tell if it was if that if that if it occurred 12 months ago or 12 years ago, if it's a permanent finding. Can you then, doctor, turn to functional differences in terms of anecdotal evidence of those around a person? So let's say that uh, maybe they suffered an incident 10 years ago but didn't have any cognitive complaints until a head injury for which imaging was done, positive findings occurred, and there's been a cognitive change noted by anyone. Would that be a way you would differentiate the two? Um, no, because it's... Uh, because it, it's um because at this at this point, unless unless there's a very unless there's a very specific sort of symptom, um, it's very difficult to then relate it to the part of the brain that's being that's been damaged, right? So so for example, if if somebody has an impairment of of uh, right hand, for example, that can be localized to a specific area of the brain, and and so there you might be able to draw. Uh, to, to put to put a time frame, put a date on that injury. However, if the complaint is more, say, headache or or cognitive, cognitive impairment, um, that's a much more less specific, or le oh, that's a much less specific complaint. It becomes very difficult to do that. Okay, uh, sticking with you, doctor, just for uh, a minute longer. Um, how does one go about uh, getting an MRI or a spec scan, and what is the cost and timeline? Um, the uh, both both MRIs and and specs are uh, are funded by OHIP, right? So um, and and uh, and spec scans are done in the nuclear medicine department, which is which is fairly common throughout Ontario, and uh, and MRIs are also fairly common, probably not quite as common as as uh, as nuclear medicine. Um, however, uh, even though um, the the actual technology is 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 fairly accessible. Um, I think experience and technique is um, varies uh, depending on obviously sort of depending on where you go. I, I, all I can say is that certainly at our institution, um, I spent a lot of time fine tuning um, 
the the quality of our studies and 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 as I mentioned, like uh, the the best way of it doing the imaging is to do a combined MRI and spec. What that also means is being able to put the two images together. So in terms of lining up an orientation, that that becomes very important. So um, so probably the best advice is. Um, while the technology is fairly fairly accessible, that you actually go to a place that is that is interested in doing this type of thing and has experience doing this type of thing, and uh, and and you know can can answer your question. Jim, I have a, a quick question for Dr. Sal, if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Uh, you you had pointed out on the MRI a dark spot, and you said that was old blood. Is that is that the blood actually in the brain, or has that been reabsorbed, and, or is that and is it what is, what is the dark spot? So so the dark spot uh, actually so it's called hemosiderin, which is mm -hmm. a, which is a blood breakdown product, right? And and um, within the brain, uh, if, bl if blood is sort of where it's not supposed to be in the brain, there will be a certain amount of time where it can get reabsorbed. However, however after, after, say, three to six months, for example, whatever's there is going to stay, and it'll probably, and chances are that it'll stay there forever. I see. All right. So, so if, if the study is positive on a, you know, depending on the time frame and the, and the chronology, so if you're, if you're doing imaging on a six-year-old case and you do see uh, evidence of previous hemorrhage there, it's going to be there forever. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's one uh, could be either for uh, an accident benefit specialist or a lawyer from Julie. Uh, insurers are starting to deny sections of OCF 18s, including reducing provider KM fees. I don't know if that's case management, capping travel time, and opining that planning and communication between client, provider, and other therapists is the cost of doing business. I've heard this from a number of you out there. How can providers respond to this as while we agree that the client's dollars need to be conserved, we cannot work under such unilateral rationing of our time that violates our college's guidelines for professional practice? Marva, do you have any experience with that? Yeah, I think with regards to the attempting to limit the amounts that they're paying um, on the breakdown of the treatment plan, what the provider is going to need to do is really try to humanize the client that they're submitting to the insurer. So I think what they really need to do is they need to make a case for if the client is, let's say, in a remote area, they need to make a case as to why they need the additional, let's say, travel expenses, and or if it's a local client and they're trying to reduce the amount of travel time and some of the other um, miscellaneous costs then you do need to present to the insurer a real good case as to why you actually need to have those particular items included as a part of treating the client as a whole. And are you finding that insurers are being receptive to your arguments? I think you have to be creative. You have to kind of know the insurer and the adjuster you're dealing with. And yes, if you can make a really good case as to why it's inherently a part of the overall treatment, then you can be successful in getting the insurer to approve some okay. of the benefits, if not all. Okay, great. Um, here's another one for, for a lawyer. What type of expert do you think is best suited to assessing behavioral and mental disorders with a view to establishing whether there's been a class four marked impairment for catastrophic impairment? Uh, Roger, do you have any experience with that? Wow. Well, um, the, uh, <clears throat> the choice would be between a psychologist and a psychiatrist. Uh, perhaps um, if it's a, a client who has a brain injury mixed with uh, emotional difficulties, a neuropsychiatrist, um, both uh, professions uh, play a, a definite role. I um, think in our practice, we have a tendency to uh, draw on both of them um, in these cases because they do have different perspectives. If I had to decide uh, between uh, one or the other, and it's a tough choice, I would probably um, opt for a psychiatrist uh, simply because uh, that's a, uh, a recognized uh, profession that uh, uh, is trained uh, to diagnose disorders um, and, and also understands the impact of uh, um, 
medications uh, being uh, consumed by the uh, the client. It, it's a tough decision, and I'd prefer not to have to make it. It's sort of a Sophie, Sophie's choice. I'd prefer to have them both, but if I have to, I'll I'll probably go to the uh, psychiatrist. Can, can I just add to that, Jim? Sure. I, I agree with everything Roger said. Um, in terms of um, the diagnosis portion of the of the test that um, set out in in Mujku and and, um, and Pastori, but um, when you're looking at the second question, which is um, yeah. you know talking about the the impact on daily activity, um, I think that you, you you also in addition to the experts Roger mentioned, you do need an occupational therapist to who's in the best position to look at function and uh, within the four spheres that are set out in the SABs and doing a, a longitudinal type of analysis over several days because the, the guides do recognize variability in function uh, over, over a period of time. I mean, we all have clients who have good days and bad days, so you do need to do um, an assessment that takes place in, in the real world over, over um, a period of time. I think an OT is the best to do that. Add to that as well, too. Sorry. Sure. It's, go it's, ahead, uh, John. It's an important issue. Uh, I, I would just, and I agree with Roger, I, I agree with Dell, but there can, there can be so much at stake on, on whether the person you know, gets to the marked impairment or, or not. I would, <clears throat> I would look at a physiatrist, a specialist in physical and rehabilitation medicine, to add, add to the mix. I mean, if you, you've gone that far with a psychiatrist or neuropsychiatrist, psychologist, an, an OT over an extended period of time, as, as Dale says, let's, 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 let's not leave anything to chance. So that's, I, would, I would look at including that, uh, that type of uh, expert in the mix. I, I think we all agree, Jim, it's a multidisciplinary assessment that's required. And uh, John really put his finger on it. There is so much at stake um, with limits. Um, um, on the tort side, at a million, which is, by the way, inadequate and should be increased, uh, that's a desperate need. Um, the uh, amount of money that's at stake on the uh, catastrophic impairment issue is almost always greater. Great. Um, here's something for, for Barb, and uh, not so much, uh, I suppose, a... Um, a question requiring an answer, but a comment, and I'd ask Barb to comment on it, regarding current changes, anti-fraud measures, and actions for cost savings. It is also important to mention the process of licensing of health care facilities has started. Could you let us know what that's about, Barb, and uh, what impact well, that might have on the process? Well, one of the recommendations, one of the main re recommendations of the government's anti-fraud task force was um, to require licensing of uh, uh, medical clinics or medical rehab clinics um, that uh, would be billing um, auto insurers. And uh, the government has uh, called for submissions, and uh, many, many stakeholders have have made their submissions to the government. I understand that there's a working group that now is working on the um, um, on the, the uh, development of a plan for rolling out a, a licensing program. It's likely that it um, it won't take effect until at least next fall. Um, the idea is to um, have uh, standards of practice with respect to uh, business operations, not the uh, medical care, but business operations, and to require adherence uh, to those um, business operation standards and uh, to use uh, licensing as a, as a, a tool to, uh, to enforce that. Um, we think that's probably a good thing, um, but because um, there, are, you know, in any in in any occupation or in any business type of business, they're 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 good guys and bad guys, and and uh, so it's nice to have a mechanism for ensuring that everyone who is in that business um, is adhering to um, best practices with with respect to their business operations. Um, but as I say, we don't expect that. It will um, roll out until next fall. Okay, thank you. If a client comes to you and at first blush they appear to be in the MIG, what are some of the things you can do? Um, Alana, why don't you uh, take a crack sure. at that? 
Um, so there are two common ways uh, that we try to get a client out of the MIG. Um, the first one being is um, we check to see if uh, the client has any symptoms that will, be, will not fall within the definition of the MIG. Um, these symptoms could be chronic pain or uh, psychological symptoms. Uh, for chronic pain, sometimes it's too often to t too soon to tell if the pain is chronic. So um, we have the client go to their family doctor and advise the family doctor or a health professional of all the symptoms. Um, with psychological symptoms, we make sure that everything is documented medically, and uh, we recommend that the client see a psychologist or a social worker for psychological treatment, or get a referral from the family doctor to see a psychiatrist, which is OHIP funded. And the second way we try to get the client out of the MIG is uh, we look at the client's pre-accident health history to see if they have any pre-existing conditions. And uh, we do this by ordering the family doctor's records from as far back as we can. Um, in some cases, you'll see clients will have uh, previous sports injuries, uh, may have previous accidents, or for clients that are older, they may have uh, arthritis. Um, we'll review the records and uh, see if there's anything in there that will prevent the client from achieving maximal recovery with the $3,500 with compelling medical evidence. Evidence. Great. Barbara, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yes, I was going to say, and also keep in mind when you're initially gathering the information from the medicals on the client, you want to keep in mind if there appears to be a partial a partial tear of a ligament or a tendon or a muscle or something, that you will want to take a look and make sure that it isn't a complete tear, because a complete tear will remove them from the make. so you'll want to make sure you investigate that thoroughly. Great, thanks. Just uh, if I might comment, on, I was very impressed with your response, Elena, um, be, and uh, y you, the seriousness with which you look for the evidence of a pre-existing condition that is in fact pre-existing. One of the problems that we're finding is that um, we have pre-existing conditions that are not identified until after the date of the accident, and um, so. <laughs> And with no records whatsoever um, um, that uh, or documentation that uh, that such a condition uh, uh, which would have limited the opportunity for recovery uh, existed or was documented prior to the injury. Of course, we all have pre-existing conditions. All of us on this panel and everyone in the audience has pre-existing conditions. <laughs> well, I do. Of course, it's a, a bit of a double-edged sword because we don't want pre-existing conditions because uh, we don't want a causation problem in tort, but then we might want a pre-existing condition to get us out of the MIG, which yeah. is why the MIG's uh, not one of our favorites. But I think, but I think Elena's explanation was, uh, was encouraging. Here's one that... Uh, um, is interesting from one of our uh, local um, uh, exceptional orthopedic team in Barrie. Um, how can you explain the fact that people in amusement parks subject to acceleration, deceleration injuries or whiplash do not develop symptoms, but a simple fender bender creates a constellation of symptoms and incapacity to return to work? Is there secondary gain in car accidents? Uh, John, why don't you give that a crack? I was, I was afraid you were going to ask me this. It's <laughs> you asked me because of my vast experience on amusement rides. Is that is that why you're asking me? It's um, I and I, I I can't speak for amusement rides, but with 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 say fender benders or rear enders or something like that, I know that the forces. Um, put on a person's or the whipping force on a head can be extraordinary especially especially if, if they've got a seat belt on because you're 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 locking in the the spine so if you'd probably suffer less forces on your on your brain if you didn't have a seat belt but so and then as dr xiao said uh the brain weighs about three pounds is is the consistency of, of tofu or jello or something like that so it can be bouncing back and forth, as in a coup contra coup, or or twisting or, or rotating. So I can see quite easily how you could suffer um, injury to your brain in a in a motor vehicle accident, and not in in one of these rides where the forces I don't think would be as quick or as or as or as or as forceful. I suppose we have to deal with the logical reality that there is potential secondary gain whenever you're in a system of compensation. It's just a natural corollary of it, and it's our job as effective counsel to be able to find ways to convince the triers of fact that 
uh, our clients aren't motivated by secondary gain because you can uh, bet your bottom dollar that uh, the jurors out there uh, will be thinking it. Um, here's another one. If a claimant has a 24-hour attendant care need and is receiving $6,000 per month in accordance with a Form 1, can the insurer deduct the hours that other service providers such as RSWs are with the claimant each day? Um, a question that comes up a lot, and I've, I've had a few of them over the last two seminars. Dale, do you want to take that one on? Sure. Um, and I, I, I haven't looked at this question in um, probably a year or two, but uh, because it does come up often, I, I had uh, some of the bright uh, lawyers in our office look for case law on this, and there wasn't any at that point in time. I think um, from a common sense point of view and from a, a literal interpretation of reading the SABs, I, I think the, that's the wrong approach. It's, it's wrong to suggest that somebody um, who has a 24-hour attendant care need and gets four hours a day of, of rehab support, let's say, um, should have their, their $6,000 reduced by the four hours. Um, because as we all know, um, $6,000 a month in the marketplace doesn't come close to purchasing 24-hour attendant care. Um, you might be lucky with, um, with a private PSW provider like a Bayshore or one of the other companies out there to, to get somewhere between 10 or 11 hours a day of coverage. So uh, when you look at, at the SABs dealing in a section, I think it's section 19 dealing with attendant care, what you, what you see is, is um, the, the, well, it used to be the Form 1, now I think it's just called the Assessment of Attendant Care Needs Form, creates a notional entitlement, and that entitlement is there to be billed, whether it's 6000 or 5000 or $4,000 a month. Um, so long as the service providers are charging the claimant um, at a reasonable rate, if they're, if they're using up all of the available money, I'm sure it still allows for plenty of hours in the day for other other types of service providers to provide their therapy. Great. Thanks, Dale. I just want to ask a question, actually, of Dale, sure. because our evidence is that uh, the vast majority of attending care that's provided is provided by uh, family members and, uh, and and friends of the of the, of the injured person. And so that care is not bought on the market, but rather is is uh, provided by, as I say, friends and family. Right. Is that correct? Uh, that's been my experience. I don't have any statistics on it, but okay. um, I, I I do recognize that oftentimes uh, the injured person's preference, of course, is to have a family member be the person who provides their attendant care. And um, I don't think that changes the analysis, particularly post September 2010, when the family members are now required to show an economic loss in order to claim the benefit. So they've had to give up some form of income in order to claim the benefit. I don't think uh, that it's reasonable to suggest that they should uh, be providing the service for, um, you know, for nothing or, or for something that's greatly re uh, less than uh, than than. Uh, you know, minimum wage in a lot of cases for people who uh, have extensive need and in are, are but are in that non-catastrophic category, and they're they're paid three thousand dollars a month. If you look at the actual number of hours of care that's provided by the family member, oftentimes it would uh, it would equal something much less than even minimum wage. And unfortunately, there's no new uh, case law or fiscal decisions on uh, on economic loss. Uh, Dr. Xiao, uh, from another one of our trusted orthopedic surgeons that we uh, love and rely on a lot, uh, please differentiate the two modalities for use in concussion versus intra-substance brain damage and what is the sensitivity of the specs. So can you help us understand the question regarding differentiating between the two modalities for use in concussion versus intra-substance brain damage and, and then give us your thoughts? Geez, I don't know. I was, I was about to ask the same thing. Um, <laughs> so I think I think what uh, what the question refers to is is concussion being a direct blow, and then intrasubstance uh, damage being uh, what, what what's called um, uh, axonal injury, right? So um, so when you damage the brain, um, a direct blow obviously creates damage that way. But, uh, but sort of similar to the whole discussion about the, the amusement park ride or a car accident, when you, when you shake the brain, um, even though you might not, it not, might not be sort of directly hit, there's a lot of neural wiring in the brain that can get, that can get 
shaken up, right? And 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 that can be damaged. So as I said, I think I'm going to interpret it as concussion meaning direct blow and in, intra substance uh, damage being um, being axonal injury. So um, according to the literature, for the direct blow part, uh, the majority of the literature says that both both MRI and brain spec are similar in sensitivity. Although in my in my experience, I'm finding actually for the for the uh, mild or moderate injury people, um, the brain spec is actually more sensitive. And I did find one article that would support that uh, that, that thinking. So again, for the direct blow uh, for direct blow injuries, my experience is that the brain spec is is more sensitive. Although the majority of the literature would say that they're both equal. For the intra-substance damage or the axonal injury damage, um, the for the most part, MRI is more sensitive for picking up that damage. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, are there any limits to the number of CAT applications a person can bring, and if so, what are they? What are they, and are there any limitation periods? Uh, Roger, do you want to take a crack at that? I think uh, this goes back to your case, Jim, that uh, you won. Uh, there are no limits on the number of CAT applications, but the circumstances have to have uh, changed. Um, and I don't believe there's a limitation period either. Um, so uh, that's, um, that's always out there. Okay. Thanks. Um, another one from one of our uh, life care planners. Uh, as a life care planner, I consult with treating professionals for opinions regarding future treatment. Will those treating professionals have to sign a Form 53 in order for me to use their opinions? John? Great, great question. Yeah. <laughs> great question. Um, I can give it to someone else for an answer if you want a few minutes. Well, I, yeah, yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure there is an answer. It's, it's, chances are you're probably only, you're already going to have a report from the doctor from whom the life care planner has asked for input. So you're already going to have a report. So this would be a supplementary report or or a you know a second report. Not and it's 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 not coming from from you, the lawyer. It's coming from the life care planner. So it's not it's not the lawyer asking for a report in accordance with Form 53. And this life care planner is doing ex exactly what what we want life care planners to do, and that is that is have a have a, a collaborative approach to the preparation of the report. So so it's it's the opinion of some of the treating individuals. But um, Jim, I, I'm going to say this: if you've if you've if you've already got a report from the health professional, you've got a form 53, and this is to assist the life care planner I don't see how I could how I could get a second form 53 so I, I would say no to that and I'm sure others will want to comment what if what if the uh, life care planner is saying for example I uh, consulted the treating physio and they recommend uh, one physiotherapy session of say 10 sessions twice a year and then I go to the occupational therapist who is recommending this and the case management who's recommending that are those treating professionals obliged to sign a form uh, 53 and will you require a report from those treating professionals in order for that life care planner to be able to rely upon those opinions? I think it depends on your judge. I mean, uh, you know, traditionally if you look at the case law like uh, Regina versus Abbey or Regina versus Lavalie, um, experts were permitted to testify um, on uh, uh, the basis of hearsay. So you didn't need to prove every factual underpinning. Um, the, there's been a more recent trend away from that, and um, I think uh, Justice, um, um, who was it, John Moore? Justice Moore um, had suggested that uh, um, if you're an occupational therapist and a life care planner, then you're permitted to opine in, within the field of occupational therapy. But uh, um, he, in particular, didn't want to hear from uh, from the OT about the other professional opinions. It's uh, in my experience, it's it's a hit and miss, and I agree with everything Dale said. Um, it depends so much on the judge as opposed to anything else. Well, that wraps up today's session. Our next webinar is April the 29th of next year, 
Uh, and uh, we've got lots more questions that I was unable to get to, for which we apologize, but we'll certainly try to get them and incorporate them into our session next time. Thanks for joining us.